Hello, and welcome to the Catching the Octopus podcast. Here, we will explore how connecting inward gives us an advantage outward. We openly talk about the obstacles and challenges and difficulties that life throws our way and how they become moments of gratitude and things that can benefit us when we look back on our lives. I'm your host, Naomi Hurley, and it is my mission to bring you top quality guests that will share with you openly their obstacles and also the techniques they use to go inward that strengthens the way that they serve themselves and others at the highest level. Thank you for joining. Let's get started. Welcome to this episode of Catching the Octopus podcast. In today's episode, I just wanted to recap the conversation and interview I had with Dr. Paula Smith. Now, Dr. Paula Smith is a presenting genius. So she has this really great knack with teaching people how to deliver impactful presenting. And she has this powerful presenting and leadership communication program. And she's been doing this for nearly four decades. So she knows her stuff. And she said some great great giveaways and gold nuggets with us in the interview. And I just wanted to recap on a few of the things we talked about and just go into a little bit more depth with them. So she has, you know, a present with impact program and a neuro presenting program, and she really understands the brain, the human brain and how that's impacted through presentations and also how to hack into it to deliver great presentations. Now, Presentations don't always have to be keynote addresses. They can just be showing up in meetings, you know, facilitating toolboxes, um, delivering proposals to potential clients. So presenting can be helpful in a huge different array of areas. And we talked first about, you know, identifying some of those belief systems that are stopping you from your powerful presenting. And you know, there's so many people, as she talked about, that says they're scared of presenting and they have a fear around it. But no one is born with a fear of presenting, as Dr. Paula says. You know, we have these things that happen to us through childhood, through you know, interactions with our caregivers, teachers, peers, all of those sorts of things over our formative years. So while we're younger, we have all of these interactions, experiences, events that tend to create a story in the subconscious mind. And that story can sometimes be really empowering and push people forward. But sometimes that story can actually be something that hinders us and holds us back. And when we're looking at powerful presenting, it's really important to look into your past to identify those belief systems that are stopping you from powerful presenting. And we talked about it a little bit, but I just want to go a little bit deeper on this. So as you may or may not know, I do work individually um, with people as well in a bit of a therapy capacity. And one of the things we do in that area is go back and regress to different events, times, spaces, scenes that have led the subconscious to believe that whatever their presenting issue is at the moment, their behavior, their feeling, their thoughts, did what the subconscious has created in a way that found at some point was helpful to them. So We've all got things that are going on in our lives now, ways we think, feel, and behave that we may not be completely happy with, but at some time, our subconscious mind thought that was helpful for us. And if it didn't believe it was helpful for us, then it wouldn't be allowing it to happen, right? So at some point it's helpful and we mosey on through life, but after a while, we tend to realize that it's no longer helpful for us. And that's why people come and see me in that therapy capacity. But when we're looking at powerful presenting, you know, at one point, not speaking out, not showing up and not putting ourselves in the limelight was helpful for us and did keep us safe at some point in time. And if that's the case, then we still have these belief systems in our subconscious that are telling us, don't do it. It's not a great idea. This isn't safe for you. 
So if we haven't had that programming, then we're probably able to get up quite easily and do these presentations. But that doesn't mean they're going to be powerful and impactful, right? Because those sorts of things, how to deliver the presentation, what to include, how to engage the audience, you know, all of that sort of stuff is learnt. And, you know, some of us may have been able to learn that through our day-to-day activities and through the work we do. But if you really want to hone any skill, then you need to go and see the expert and tap into their brain and, you know, ask them for help around it. And I'm a very big advocate of finding someone that does something really well and learning from them. And and that's what Dr. Paula does really well is help people in that space. So she also spoke about the three key elements for powerful presenting. And these things are influencing others when you're doing the presentation. Now, they originated from Aristotle and Dr. Paula says that they should be in every presentation that we do. So the first one is ethos. The second one is pathos. And the third one is logos. And if I start with ethos, this is setting yourself up as a knowledge expert, an authority with credibility and trust with your audience. And this is really important also if you look at the factors of influence. So someone that doesn't seem to be a knowledge expert or an authority figure in the area you're looking at, or even someone that you can trust or have any credibility for, then you're not going to listen to them. And you're not going to be influenced by what they have to say and what they're presenting to you because you don't give it any street cred, right? So one of the first things is setting yourself up in that space. And that can be done through listing out, you know, your qualifications or your experience and those sorts of things, which is very helpful, but also setting yourself as an authority figure in that area means just being really confident with what you're presenting. Know that what you're presenting, you are a knowledge expert on and having the confidence to shift into that space and show that to the room, you know, show that to your listeners. And if you're coming in a space that's authentic and connected with who you are and the messaging that you want to send, then it's easy to build credibility and trust with the people that are there to listen to you. So the second one is pathos. So that's the emotion and the sharing of stories. And the thing that all humans connect with really strongly is emotion. And if you watched a a movie that had no ups and downs, no triumphs, no wins, um, was no emotional connection at all, you'd probably think it was pretty boring, right? And that's the same as when you're going to listen to a presentation. So some people can invoke this emotional connection in a few different ways. And the most important way is sharing stories. And when you share stories, that allows people to become connected with you in a space, especially if those stories are relatable, if they show that you're real. Um, And if they have some emotional connection, it makes even more of an impact. You know, I remember in my early presenting days, I was doing a keynote for a a group that I'm involved in and I got up there and I thought I did a fantastic job Um, in my early days. You know, you don't know what you don't know. So you always think you do a great job until you learn how to do a better job, right? But anyway, I walked off the stage and I thought I did a fantastic job, was really impressed. And then the speaker after me was someone that had been involved in a car accident and had actually had physical injuries that permanently disabled them. And they spoke about their journey and they spoke about the accident. They spoke about what they're doing now and how they're progressing. And the audience was so engaged. You could have heard a pin drop. He had everyone eating out of the palm of his hand. And that was through the emotion and the story that he was sharing and how they were connected. Now, I loved his presentation, but a little part of me was like, oh, that kind of trumped mine, way trumped it, right? Because it was that engaging emotion space. So when you look in and engaging with people, tell a bit of a story. Um, the best story is to tell us stories that are real because people will know if you're being authentic or not, but add in some emotion to it. Now, you'll often find if you are involved in any of my programs, my training programs, or listen to this podcast that I do tend to share stories, but I also consider 
the confidence of those people that are around me, right? Um, and make sure that stuff is confidential, right? Because I don't want to be sharing things that aren't mine to share. So I'm very conscious and aware that there's a lot of people connected with me, clients, family, friends that have great stories that I can share with my audience and help connect with them. But at the same time, understand that some people want to keep their privacy to themselves. And so I'm very conscious of making sure I don't share a lot of personal details that would identify them or let people know who they are. So just keep that in mind when you are sharing stories. And the last one is the logos, you know, that logic, the data and the facts. And that's really important because people need to see the logic, the data and the facts. You know, it's nice to feel good from a presentation, but when you can take away some really great tangible information as well, that's super helpful too. So with the logic data and facts, that could be percentages of different things. Um, I know when I'm doing presentations around the subconscious mind, I often share that 95% of everything we do in a day is driven by the subconscious. So only 5% of our actions are consciously driven, which is a bit mind blowing. You know, when I share that, people then sort of get a bit curious and curiosity is another element that Dr. Paula Smith did speak about. She said, you know, the end result of any presentation that we give, whether that be a keynote address, whether that be a toolbox meeting, or even just a presentation to a client, the end result is inspiring the audience to change their behavior or their belief systems into understanding what you're trying to share. And I spoke a little bit about curiosity with her because that's kind of what I do. I Everything I deliver, I try and invoke a little bit of curiosity so that people become a little bit more open-minded. Now, Dr. Paula shared a little bit more about that and she said curiosity creates attention and it does it through the dopamine release in the brain. So the brain releases the dopamine which then gives you that connection straight away. And that comes from that curiosity and wonder and wanting to explore and learn more. So that's a really good way to be able to connect in. And she also shared that it's really important to get connection right from the start of your presentation. Now, when I do a presentation, I tend to connect straight away. Um, I don't get nervous anymore, which is really great because that used to be um, a little bit hindering when I first started out. But what I do find is I, I work a lot with energy and I feel energy really quite intensely from others. And at about the between two and five minutes, and sometimes it's done straight away, I actually feel the energy of the room focused on me. And at that point, my subconscious says, don't stuff this up. You've got their attention. You better keep it, right? And a few little nerves do come in. But it's really important to be able to get that connection right from the start, right? It's not about waiting for that two to five minutes in, although that's when I get a little nervy sometimes. That's because I've got the connection, right from when I begin um, with the presentation that I do. So some tips to opening your presentation and inciting that curiosity or getting attention from Dr. Paula Smith was starting with a story, you know, going straight in and starting in the delivery of a story and seeing what that brings up and how that can connect with the audience. She also suggested maybe using proverbs and quotes and They don't need to be really cheesy quotes, as one of her students said to her, but, um, you know, quotes that are going to connect with the people. I like to do, um, well, I do a presentation on embracing change and, and a bit of an address on that. And when I do that, one of the quotes I start off with is from Mike Tyson. And it says, um, oh, what is the exact quote now? I'm going to paraphrase, but it's kind of like everything is going along well until you get punched in the face, right? And that's exa- then people kind of relate and go, well, that's what change does, right? We're all keen for change and we're all going to embrace it. But as soon as it becomes something that impacts us greatly, everything changes in our body. So starting with a proverb or a quote is a really um, great way as well, or even just starting with a statistic 
And that statistic I used earlier, you know, 95% of what we do in any given day is driven by the subconscious mind. That's a really great statistic to start with as it starts people thinking, oh, I wonder what I do that's driven from the subconscious mind. If you're enjoying this podcast and you want Naomi or any of her guests featured on your podcast or as a keynote speaker at your next event, you'll find their contact details included in the show notes. If you'd like to learn more about how you can work with Naomi individually or as part of your strategy to improve leadership in your business, then review the courses, offers and services at getupandgrowconsulting.com.au. We also talked a little bit about priming and she talked to Dr. Paula Smith talked about the law of primacy and recency. And what that is, is the fact that we remember the first and the last thing that we hear and see. And you might have heard in one of my other podcasts, I talked about the feedback sandwich and I was quite shocked that they're still educating people on that. Um, in the formal education space, when they're talking about feedback with leadership, because I don't really believe it's an amazing model. Yes, it works and it's been working for a long time, but I don't think it's the best model out there. And this is a good example. Why not, right? Because we remember the first thing, which is usually have some good stuff that you tell someone, then give them the constructive feedback and then end it with some good stuff. That's the sandwich. But people aren't really connecting with what the constructive area is, right? Because they're looking at, oh, okay, I must be doing a great job and off they go. So it's not really helping them modify their behavior. But when we're doing a presentation, it's important to understand those priming laws because however we start and however we finish are going to be the two things that are actually the most remembered. So it's really great to start and end with things that are going to be impactful, that people can take away and that they can use to grow, learn, or develop from. Um, she did say that there's other strategies that are is used to prime the audience so they're ready to receive the information. And, look, it was just one podcast interview, and I know in her course she goes even deeper. So if you want to know all of the priming that she suggests that you use, then I would recommend signing up for her program. But, you know, there's lots of priming activities that we can do. There's um, if you look at some of the biases that exist, you can have a look at that bias and then prime into that space. Now, the last episode I did was on priming. So if you want some more information on what that is and how that works, just go back to the last episode from myself. I think it was episode 50 by memory, which is on priming, and that can give you some more information. Now, Dr. Paula Smith also spoke about reading the room. And she said, you can check in with energy. You can use key questions to ask to see how the room is going. And you can do use that at the beginning of the presentation to feel or gauge how things will be received. Now, in my space, um, the way that I do it, I check in with energy more so. Um, I do ask key questions, but I feel like unless the room knows each other, and the room is a really psychologically safe space, not a lot of people will actually answer the questions that you're asking. Now, it's good to set the tone. Questions are great for setting the tone or for priming or for creating curiosity and open-mindedness. But for me, I read the room through energy. And I look at how many people are distracted. I look at how many people are engaged. I watch people's body language. I also look at their um, facial expressions and, and how they're interacting. Are they writing notes or are they playing on their phone? Then I look in when I've looked at the physical side of things and what energy they're bringing to the presentation, I actually go into an energy level. And because of that, I can feel shifts in energy. So I have um, a wide range of things that I talk about, and some of them can go on to the esoteric kind of level of stuff, which isn't always accepted by a science-based mind, right? So when I'm trying to go into those areas and bring that additional knowledge in, then I will often just read the room. 
And if I say something that creates too much of a disconnect on an energy space, then I know that that's not the audience to go there with. So I'll switch back to the more traditional um, content in that I'm delivering. So it's really important as a great presenter to be able to adapt what you're delivering to be able to meet the needs of the people that are there before you. Um, I often find, now this wasn't from Dr. Paula Smith, so she may disagree. Um, she's got her own ways of, of teaching people how to present. She does that amazingly. So I definitely don't want to take that away. But I've spoken with people that have, you know, PowerPoint presentations, which are amazing, but they'll go up there with notes um, personally, myself, I find that notes have always just disheveled me. They've, when I've got notes, I'm too worried about sticking to the note format and I tend to get lost a little bit because when you're in a really good presenting space, you're in flow. But, and you're in this space where you're actually delivering um, content to people and you're reading and feeling the room and you're going to wherever you're guided to go with the information you want to share. And then to stop and go back and check notes and go, oh, I forgot this thing or, oh, I need to talk about that can actually throw us off a little bit. And if we're not as experienced in the presenting space, sometimes our notes as well can cause us a little bit of anxiousness or nerves uh, because when you're doing the presenting, a pause seems a really long time and you then think, oh, no, I've got to get this quickly, which then creates more frustration. And when you're frustrated, um, your cognition isn't kicking in as well as it should. So then it causes more issues. But anyway, that's the cycle. We can talk about that another time. But I tend to find your slides should be more of your guide. So if there's things that you don't want to miss out on, if there's key points that you want to address, then pop them on your slides and just let yourself go um, a little bit more fluid because that's what's going to connect with the audience. Now, this can be a bit difficult when you're doing those business-related presentations in front of a client or in a toolbox. You may need to have um, some notes handy, but I wouldn't write out your whole presentation or write out your whole speech. I would definitely just have some dot points that you can just refer down to and just tick them off as you cover them um, so that you know where you're going to be. But if you want some real good insights into how the technical element works, then definitely reach out to Dr. Paula Smith. She also spoke about the more we present or be in front of people, the more we create an expanded awareness. And that's what I was talking about um, when I was speaking about that energy connection. The more we do it, the more we feel it, the more that we can connect with it. And if you speak with any major sports person or anyone that's really great at what they do, they will tell you that they get into the zone or they get into the flow. And the more that we're in front of people, the more that we can get into that space of being in flow or being in the zone. And that's where really great impactful presenting can come through. Now, she came back a little bit to the fear element, right? And the fact that people do fear going up and doing presentations, um, but practicing being uncomfortable and sitting without our fear or within our fear rather is the remedy for that. And, you know, the brain likes what's familiar. And I often talked about this, so you may have heard me say this before, but anything that's unfamiliar to the brain back many, many moons ago, many, many hundreds and thousands of years ago, um, more like thousands of years ago, I should say, over thousands. Anyway, anything that was unfamiliar to the brain was something to be feared, right? So anything we didn't recognize, if it was a plant we didn't recognize, it was to be feared. If it was an animal we didn't recognize, it was to be feared. If it was a weather pattern we didn't recognize, it was to be feared. If it was tribes or people we didn't know, they were to be feared. And so our brain is wired to be scanning our environment at all times and looking for things that are different and it will then fear them. Unless we have awareness and we can overrule that fear. So being practicing being uncomfortable, you know, making the unfamiliar familiar is a way to desensitize from that. And that allows us to sit within that fear. And I have a great 
friend, Adam Hill, who is the host of the Flow Over Fear podcast. And that's his whole specialty is talking about and navigating fear. And even he says it's not about combating fear. It's about sitting in there, making space for it and rising with fear. And that's how you become able to get into your flow rather than being regulated and ruled by that fear element. So connecting, building rapport, influencing others, you know, they're all relevant for presenting, but they're also relevant for leadership and life. And even as a leader, if you're not getting up in front of a group of people, using these techniques or these gold nuggets that were shared by Dr. Paula Smith can still help you in your leadership component because it's about engaging with people. It's about establishing relationships. It's about building trust and credibility and becoming an authority figure to those people in your team. And once you've been able to connect with them and build the rapport you need, that's when you can come from a place of influence. Now, when we're influencing though, we have to be a little bit careful with that. Now, I'm going a bit off tangent now away from the presentation space and more into the leadership and life space. So influencing others, if you are a strong influencer, then we have to be careful and make sure that we're using our superpowers for good, right? Because it's not going to end well if you're influencing people in a way that isn't positive, right? That isn't going to be enhancing their life and creating greatness for them. And sometimes we also need to be aware that influencing others might not be the best way to go about things. You know, they might not be ready to be influenced or they might not want to be influenced. Now, I have had a few clients um, that have come through that have seen me in that therapy space and I've picked up throughout the session that they're not in a space where they're ready to let go of this part of them that feels like it's keeping them safe. And so I then change and adapt in the way that I finish the session with them because they're not in a space where they're ready to be influenced. And that can then come across sometimes as condescending or that you're not connecting or just make them feel terrible or make them feel inadequate, unworthy, unloved, all that sort of stuff. So we need to be aware of that. Um, When we're in a leadership position, if there's someone that's not performing and we're not able to influence them, then that's a different situation. We then need to, there's a lot of other factors we need to consider there on what the next steps will be. Um, in that space. But it's not about controlling people. It's about trying to bring out the best in people. Now, um, we also need to be conscious of the different cycles that go through. And I have a guest, an upcoming guest, which will be great. And we'll talk about this a little bit more, Andy. And I was speaking with him the other day and, and he brought some great things to my attention in that we talk about this influence space and how we're going to do this with people, but we often miss the diversity aspect of that. And we tend to base all of our learnings and our teachings and our impressions on a a avatar that's from the majority, right? That's from a majority group or a majority um, aspect. And so when there are minority groups that are in and around us as leaders or as presenters, if we're not really careful to make sure that there's an inclusion aspect, we may lose them. And the idea is to try and engage everyone. Um, So that was just a little nice short recap of the interview with Dr. Paula Smith. I'm really grateful um, for her jumping on and doing the interview with me. She does have a book. It's called The 52 Powerful Presentation Principles. So um, definitely, I think that was all it was powerful presentation principles. Unsure. If you go to the episode, um, you will find a link as well to her presenting program. That's her online masterclass that you can join in with and also um, ability to contact her via her website if you're interested in learning more about what she does and what she has to offer. 
So that's it from me today. Um, thanks for listening in and I hope you enjoyed this episode and Dr. Paula Smith's episode. I know it was really fun for me and I really loved connecting with her. So enjoy and I look forward to serving you in our next episode. Thanks for joining in and listening to this episode of Catching the Octopus podcast. It's been great having you here. And if you'd like to go and like and subscribe and maybe even leave a five-star rating if you think it's worth it, I'd really appreciate it. I look forward to seeing you in our next episode.